Thanks, Kathleen. Um, Cindy Pensler sent me a, a, a wonderful bio and said she didn't care whether I read it or she read it. So I'm going to read the bragging part. I mean, I'm going to brag <laughs> about her and I'm going to let her uh, share with you who, to whom she's dedicating this program to and why. Um, but uh, Cindy says she's a true Blue Jayhawk alum. She graduated from undergrad at KU with an honors degree in biology in 1981. Oh, Cindy, you reveal the year. Good for you. Um, <laughs> my undergrad, she said her undergrad research was on the electron microscope. Wow, is that from the dark ages? <laughs> Med medical school graduation was in 1985 and she finished her residency in 1989. She has practiced in Topeka with a satellite office in Junction City for 32 years and officially retired one month ago. She was part of the national clinical research conducted for the development of, Cindy, please pronounce. Latanoprost. Thank you. Now the most commonly used medication for glaucoma. She can't begin to count the thousands of cataract surgeries and lasers she performed. This was really unusual for women in the 80s as only 7% of all ophthalmologists were women and many did not do surgery. Happily, that, that number is now 50%. Cindy has served on the board of the Shawnee County Medical Society, the Kansas State Board of Ophthalmology and is a liaison for the Kansas Ophthalmology to Blue Cross Blue Shield. She was on the KU Alumni Association National Board for five years and currently serves on the board for Audio Reader at KU. And um, as you may or may not know, is a huge friend and volunteer for the Lawrence Public Library. Um, Cindy, I'm gonna let you take it away with that um, and share the last part of that bio. Oh, I just wanted to dedicate today's talk. Um, I sent out a letter in medicine, you, you learn a lot in your residency um, and in medical school about the science of medicine. And I thank my patients for 32 years of learning the love and the life of medicine, kind of the nitty gritty, um, wonderful, lovely parts of medicine. And so this, this talk goes to the patients. Most of these most of, if any of my patients are, are online, um, most of them will have heard a fair amount of this just from sitting in the chair. I've spent um, probably 40 years trying to avoid behind, being behind a podium. I am not, uh, speaking is not one of my grand um, loves in life, but when the door is closed in a room, there's nothing I like better than to educate a patient and answer questions. And I am typical of a lot of women physicians. Um, we had to change my scheduling really pretty early in my career because typically women do spend more time per patient than men do. Doesn't mean the care is better, it's just different. And it's something that's well known and that, you know, it's a study right now on why women don't, why women physicians don't make as much as men. And part of it is because of our volume. We've got to quit talking, I guess, so much, but, but I like that part of it. So I'm just going to pretend that you all are, are my patients and we'll go from there. Um, my first slide, Kathleen, if you can pull that up, the, the quote on this is, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight, but no vision. And that's, that's by, you know, one of our famous heroes, Helen Keller. Um, and this is a, this is just an example. I told Kathleen that I wanted this to be, I want, I want you to take home things that will help you understand vision for yourself as, as you go on. But um, vision is really important. Just looking at this picture, it's, it's so beautiful of a, a lake for, for Susan and for anyone else out there who is visually impaired. Uh, we go to Bay Lake, Minnesota every summer. And this was a sunrise with a horizon and there were clouds in the sky. 
and the lake was so calm that you can pretty much flip this picture upside down and you can't tell what's up and what's down. It, you can just get lost in it. And it really captured the feeling that I had that morning. So I'm gonna start with anatomy after I just tell you that I'm not gonna be too sciencey, but I think we all have to kind of have a feeling of where we're going. And what I found over the years, um, it's amazing how many people will come in and they don't have one problem, they've got three problems or they may have more than three problems. And so to, to kind of break it up, to make it easier to understand, I like to start at the front of the eye and move back. So we're gonna talk about five different disease processes that are very much associated with age. And we're gonna work from the front back. The first will be dry eye. The second will be cataracts. The third will be glaucoma. The fourth will be macular degeneration, or I guess the fourth will be diabetic retinopathy and the fifth will be macular degeneration. So when we look at the eye, the front of the eye, the cornea is the clear domed part over the front of the eye. And that's where we're gonna hit the dry eye part. Um, the pupil behind the pupil is the lens that you can see. And that is what gets cloudy in a cataract. As we move further back in the eye, you will see the optic nerve, which is kind of the cable that takes the message to the, the brain. And that is the part of your eye that is damaged by glaucoma. And then the retina is where we will see the, the diabetic retinopathy and um, macula. And macula age-related macular degeneration. So we'll move on to the next one. So this little guy um, is to remind us that when we're out buzzing around outside, um, there's a lot of wind, there's a lot of exposure to the elements, and it is probably one of the leading uh, exacerbating factors in dry eye. Dry eye is a really common problem. Most patients come to see me starting in about September and they come in because their eyes are itchy and they want allergy medication. And I have to give them the news that it's not allergies, it's actually dry eyes. Um, this is very much a, a part of aging. Our tear film is made up of three different layers. Um, and I don't know, are, do you have a picture of me on here or are you just seeing the bird? We can yeah. see you. Oh, you can see me? Yes. Okay, yes. good. All we right. We can see you. <clears throat> okay, I didn't know whether you could or not. Um, folks, if you have your view on, uh, it, when you click up on the view button, you wanna click on side-by-side -side speaker. And you should, it, there's side-by-side -side speaker and then there's side-by-side -side gallery. If you wanna see, Cindy, as large as possible, click on side-by-side -side speaker. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, so the tear layer is made up of three layers. The bottom layer is a mucus layer, and that's made by the covering over the sclera, the white part of our eye. The next layer is a watery layer that's made from the lacrimal gland, which is up and behind our eyeball. So, and every time we blink, we blink down a new wash of tears. The third layer is made by an, an oil that is spilled on to that tear film. So it's almost like a float of oil and it protects our tear film from evaporating too quickly. So if any three of those layers are deficient, the symptoms are all the same. Our eyes itch, they may burn. People may say they had their eyes just get tired at night. And I ask them, I always say, so then do you fall asleep? Well, no, not that kind of tired. They just feel tired. Um, but the one thing that kind of is the, the clicker for me is when I examine under the slit lamp, 
not only is the cornea dry, but the eye is white. It's a nice quiet eye. It's not red from an infection or an inflammation, it's just dry. And the, the causes for that are usually aging, um, but also autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's disease, those can all make dry eyes worse. When we read, when we watch TV, especially a scary movie, we don't blink as often. So when you're reading a book, and I'm a huge reader, and typically we all like to read more in the afternoons and evenings, we don't make as many tears as the day goes on. Our eyes, so we're doing the worst things. We're trying to read right when our eyes are, are the most dry. And it's okay, but we have to recognize that and use drops is usually the treatment for this. There's a lot of talk about flaxseed, um, omega vitamins, but I, I think the starting point and the really the base of all dry eye treatments are artificial tears. And Kathleen, you can move. So the, these are the pictures. These are, I'm not endorsing these, but they are the most common ones that you will see over the counter. Everything I'm talking about is over the counter. The, the drops come, the cysteine comes in a bottle like this, whereas the, the boxes back behind are a non-preserved artificial tear, and they come in a vial that looks like this. Now, you can guess, you can get a lot more drops in this, so it's gonna be a lot less expensive for packaging than this, and that is true. But anything in a bottle has a preservative. And after you've used that preservative about four times in a day, oftentimes the preservative is irritating to the front of the eye. So I usually say use this because it's more economical, four times a day. If that's not enough, supplement it with one of these. When you open these, you just tear them off and you have one vial, you can tear off the top, put the drop, put the drop in, and you can repeat that as many times as you want. You could use these types of artificial tears every five minutes, all day long, and it would do nothing bad to your eye and only feel great, but it would be very expensive. So, and it would be very time consuming. So when I, I've kind of over the years say, a lot of patients don't want to flip back and forth in between. I will tell them open one, use it, you know, every hour, every hour and a half for half the day and then throw it away. The main thing is there's no preservative in it, which is wonderful, but it can get contaminated. So you don't want an infection. So never use it from one day to the next. If you see a spouse that leaves one out overnight, throw it away. Don't, you don't want to reuse it from one day to the next, but these are by far going to be your most soothing and comfortable and wonderful um, feeling of all the drops. And, and the big question that I'm going to probably hear, which I'll try to kind of subvert <laughs> along the way is, you know, what, what's the best kind to use? And there is no magic on the brand. Get some that you like, try, if, if you see your optometrist or ophthalmologist, ask them for samples. And whichever one you like the best is what you should go, should, you should go out and get. The magic isn't in the drop. The magic is using the drops. If the drops don't work, if that's not enough, there are lubricants that be, can be used at night, but the new mainstay that we're using is a, um, a prescription dry eye medication. There are three currently out, Zydra, Restasis, and Sequa. They're used twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. They really work, but they're very expensive. Insurance companies oftentimes do not like to cover them. And one of the prerequisites is, is that you have tried the regular eye drops and the non-preserved eye drops prior to an insurance company um, allowing the use of the prescription drops. Um, so that's, go ahead. Was there, was, oh. The, 
I didn't hear when. Yeah, if anyone has a question, um, go ahead and put it in the chat and then I will either call on you or just read your question to Cindy as we go along. Okay. Um, do the Altmans have a question? Their hands up. Oh, I, I'm not. I don't have that view. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, Altmans, do you have a question? No, that was a that was a wave and a clap. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was a hand raise from before and a clap for okay. Capital Center. Okay. Oh, got my wow. emojis okay. wrong. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. So let's um, go to the next slide, which is um, really we're going to kind of move on to glaucoma. The reason why I put glaucoma second is because the way we check most pressures is on the front of the eye. So that's the drop that your doctor puts in that's yellow. And then they will do what's called applanation tonometry, where we're actually pushing against the cornea and we see some Myers that we line up, which tell us the, the, the pressure in that eye. A normal intraocular pressure is 21. But the kicker of glaucoma is I have seen patients nearly blind with pressures of 11. And I have seen other patients go for years with a pressure of 27 and never develop any glaucoma. So this is why it is very important. If I'm going to say one thing today that I want you to take home, it is, it's very important after the age of 60 to have an annual eye exam. I'm gonna say that again. I can say that all day long. I could say that for the rest of this hour and, and that would be, I would feel like that was the one thing I wanted you to take home. It's very important to have an annual eye exam. That pressure reading and more importantly, the examination of the optic nerve is really in the vast majority of patients with glaucoma, the only way that it is picked up in a timely fashion to prevent vision loss. Glaucoma, there's two ways we see. One way is how clear we see, how detailed and fine and clear and crisp things look. But the other way that we see is how much we see. In other, in other words, our field of vision. A glaucoma patient may have perfect 20-20 vision, but they only have this much. So with that much visit, vision, you think about how you would read, you, you couldn't drive. And by the time the glaucoma starts out in the periphery and erodes our vision in from the side, by the time we actually recognize that we have a problem, it's almost too late to treat. So there's nothing that is more devastating for me than having patients come in with an optic nerve that looks like the one on the right side. So the optic nerve should look like a nice pink donut with a small hole in the middle, like a cake donut instead of the regular <laughs> raised glazed donut. It's got a small area in the middle. I think if I show right here, you can see, can you see my arrow? Yes. Okay, so it's got a small area here. It should comprise about 30% of the size of the optic nerve. Whereas in glaucoma, in this patient, it takes up about 85 to 90% of their optic nerve, that cupping, that we call it cupping that occurs. And that is an eye that has probably very little uh, peripheral vision and maybe has what we call split fixation where they may only see a small area in the middle, but it's only half of it, right in the middle, it's cut off. So they may not see anything below to read a book, to look down, to read. So. The way that that's picked up is during an exam. And, you know, if this patient walked in, the good news is, is that we have this eye. We have an eye that we can work with and that we can say, if they hadn't come in until they noticed it in both eyes, they would have very little chance for useful vision for the remainder of their life. So glaucoma is one, you can't see it. It doesn't hurt. Um, your eye doesn't get red. 
your vision doesn't get blurry, it's picked up on an eye exam. The risk factors for glaucoma are often a family history, but the vast, again, the vast majority of people I see have no family history of glaucoma. They may be African, Hispanic, or Asian. Those are risk factors. Previous eye injuries, having had a black eye when they were a kid, um, either being really farsighted, really nearsighted, high blood pressure is a risk factor, diabetes is a risk factor. So the biggest, the biggest part of prevention with glaucoma is an annual eye exam, and that's for anyone over the age of 60. From the ages of 40 to uh, 60, I would say once every two, two years, um, up to the age of 40, every four years, but a dilated eye exam every year, dilated eye exam every year after the age of 60. Okay. The so treatment you know for glaucoma is um, eye drops. And there's been a lot of progress. I think there were maybe three or four when I first started. Now we have a plethora of eye drops that we can use. And even the newest treatment for glaucoma is what's called MIGS surgery. MIGS, it's not like a Russian fighter pilot, fighter plane. It's um, MIGS stands for minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. It's a small surgery and there are a number of different types. It's not just one type of surgery that can be done at the same time that cataract surgery is done. So for someone who is on maybe two different glaucoma drops, they may have mild to moderate glaucoma. They're 65, 70 years old. When they have their cataract surgery done, to have that procedure done at the same time, and that's the only time it's available. It's not a standalone procedure. It's only done with the cataract surgery. Then it may delay the onset of their, um, the need for any further type of surgery, more aggressive surgery, they may never need it. They may be able to get rid of some of their drops. That's kind of been the new thing in the last five years. It's just exploded and has been a really positive thing in the treatment of, of glaucoma. Cindy, okay, let's, yes. Uh, I was just gonna read, I think you answered Shelly's question, but she says, when you said the dilation, is that the glaucoma test? Does no, the glaucoma test is done before, that is just standard. When you go in and you, you go in for your eye exam, the first thing that they will do is check your vision. And then the second thing that they will do is they will check your pressure. And then they will put in the dilating drops to do the dilated exam for the doctor to look in the back of the eye. Okay, but the glaucoma test needs to occur every year as well, not every other year. Correct. It, okay. it, and it will, when you have that dilated exam, when you sign up for a dilated exam, you're automatically getting a, a pressure check. Okay. Yeah. That's it. And I will, I'll ask her the eye drop questions a little bit later and, oh yeah, the gl glaucoma test, that's that little puff of air, right? It can be, there are numerous different ways. There's a tono pen that actually taps that uh, the technician can tap on the front of your eye. Or um, in our office, we tend to do a lot of what, what we call applanation tonometry, where the doctor does it. When I bring the tonometer tip, you put in the yellow drop and then the, the little blue light comes up close and that's when you're getting your pressure checked. Okay. All right, so let's flip. So this is just a, an example of an optic nerve from uh, glaucoma. And the, the picture on the left shows a lot of, this is a picture of the optic nerve. This is called an OCT. And it's done by passing beams of light through the tissues in the back of your eye. It's just like a bright light. And we see it as a picture but it measures the thickness of the nerve tissue of the optic nerve and around the optic nerve. And it will show us if there's a loss. So if you look on the left side, the, the nerve, without looking at the nerve itself, you can see there's a lot of blue, there's a lot of yellow, and down below, there's a little bit of yellow down below that we don't want there. Whereas on the left side over here, 
we're seeing a lot of red and we're seeing a lot of red up here. I'm not seeing that. I'm sorry, I'm not getting the numbers as clear as what I had them, but the numbers are really low on the, on the left side compared to the right. And that just tells us that there has been a lot of nerve damage, especially as I'm showing down here with this pointer, especially down inferiorly, down below in the optic nerve on this left side. Okay, let's flip. And this is a visual field. Most of you have had some type of a screening field. This is a more what we call a formal Humphrey visual field. Everyone has a black dot. That's our blind spot. We all have a blind spot. And all that is, is where the optic nerve is shown on the visual field because the optic nerve is not retina. So you, you don't have any vision where the optic nerve is. And this is a normal optic nerve. This is a normal visual field. This is nice peripheral vision. This patient who happens to be my office manager <laughs> has wonderful vision. Okay, let's flip to the next one. This is a patient who has severe glaucoma. And this is where I mentioned that the loss will start in typically nasally, this is in a left eye, and this is the nasal port portion of the vision. This is the blind spot, but you can see there's an area coming all the way down below and it splits the vision oh. right here horizontally. And I'm sorry to interrupt. We can't really see what you're pointing at. Okay. Because yeah. you're now describing things, but we don't, yeah, we don't know okay. what you're talking about. Okay. So this is the dark area down below, which is the area. Is my pointer showing or is yours, Kathy? No, it's no, mine. My point, my point. Oh, is that yours, Kathleen? It's mine. And I'm guessing. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying yes. to. So it's, it's along the, the horizontal midline, right in the middle right of this field. And down below, you can see all the dark area. That's all vision that is lost. Okay. Okay. Let's flip to the next one. Okay. I think we'll flip past this one because that's the same thing. It's just okay. showing nasal visual field loss. Okay. And, and this, is, this is just a reminder. Don't be loony. Go get your <laughs> eye exam once a year. <laughs> Okay, flip one more. Okay, so the next topic I want to talk about and just touch on is cataracts. This is a normal eye on your left. If you notice the pupil, it's nice and dark. This is a cataract on the right, on the left eye. This is an area that is, has a cloudy lens. The lens looks white. And when I look at it with a slit lamp, it also looks white. This patient sees fogginess. And the number one symptom is glare. The number one onset is when driving, especially at night. People will start noticing that at night, the light seems so bright and they splay out and it just didn't used to be like that. And that's usually glare from a cataract. Okay, we'll flip. So cataracts are the, um, the number one cause of vision loss in the entire world. In the United States, about 17% of us over the age of 40 have cataracts. So when um, Kathy told me that there were about 60 people that were gonna be watching our presentation today, then I would estimate that there are about 10 people in the audience that have cataracts. That doesn't mean that they're bad enough that they need surgery, but it means that they're bad enough that they're probably affecting their vision to a small or large degree. Of that number, about three people have probably already had cataract surgery. So based on the statistics in the United States, it's a very common problem. The nice thing about cataracts is they're treatable, successfully treatable. The success rate of cataract surgery should be around 95 to 97%. That's awesome. It's the most successful surgery that's done in the United States. It's fast, it's painless. Um, we do it now using a topical anesthetic and usually it's done in an outpatient setting. So you can usually come in, check in, have your, have your eye dilated, 
have your surgery done and be home in usually about three hours. Um, there are still a lot of drops that we're using, but we're even getting better at that on lowering the number of drops. Usually it's done with no stitches. Um, so it's a really nice procedure. I'd like to say that afterwards you could see as well as this guy who was flying at me at the lake, but he's going to always see about four to five times better than the best human eye. <laughs> Okay. We have we have one question about the cataract surgery. What uh -huh. if you don't what if you don't need cataract surgery but could benefit from the glaucoma surgery since they don't do the MIGs without the cataract surgery? Right. Um, you would still want to wait. It may if the glaucoma is significant enough that surgery is being used um, because of significant vision loss then usually it's not a MIGS procedure that's done. It's usually a trabeculectomy or a shunt or a tube. There are different, more aggressive glaucoma surgeries that are done. So it's, it's just that it's a small procedure that can delay the necessity for a bigger surgery down the road. And it's not something that has to be done right now. I mean, it can wait until you have your cataract done. You can stay on your drops and then have, have the cataract and the MIGs done down the road. Okay. Okay. So we'll flip. Yeah, and I, I will get to the rest of the questions at the end. I'm kind of picking and choosing at this point. Okay, okay. So this is a picture of the back of our eye. We've moved into the diabetic retinopathy point. Diabetic retinopathy is the number one cause of vision loss in the United States in working age people. And the bad thing about it is, as it is as successful as cataract surgery is, surgery on an eye that looks like this is very difficult. My brother's a retina specialist. He said, hey, if you're gonna give a talk, I said, oh, I'm already gonna tell everybody they have to come in for their yearly dilated exams. Him being a retina specialist, he says, it, there's nothing that breaks my heart more than having somebody come in with an eye that looks like this when we could have prevented this if they had come in five years ago for their yearly dilated exams. So just another reason, another disease. This is one that if, if I'm showing you this area right here, can you see my my no over um this is me again <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm just kind of going around in a circle kathleen come over to your left here keep coming keep coming keep coming right there right okay. smack dab there that is the macula that's the center of your vision so if you think of a tennis court it takes the net takes up about five percent of the whole court right but you can't play tennis without that net this is the same thing with your vision. You can't see without that tiny 5%. That area does 95% of our vision. So this patient could very easily come into our office with this appearance and not realize they had any problems because that area looks perfect. But they've had terrible hemorrhages. They've got leakage with the little white spots out to the left are areas of swelling and leakage from blood vessels because in diabetes, it's a disease of blood vessels. The blood vessels turn into like a leaky garden hose and they leak out lots of fluids and they break and they bleed and they then cause scarring, which can then lead to retinal detachment. And at that point, it's kind of, you've kind of lost the ball game. It's really hard to get a good result. So you want to catch it a lot earlier than this, but this is the kind of patient that can present. And it's hard for them to understand how severe the problem is. Today, it's a lot easier because we have pictures. You know, we have these opportunities to have real-time photos in the office. And I think that makes it easier to understand. The treatment for this, is better blood sugar control, uh, a steady hemoglobin A1C. In diabetics, in ophthalmology, I would rather have a diabetic with their A1C a tiny bit higher, but steady, 
rather than trying to have such strict control that their blood sugar is bouncing up and down a lot. The fluctuations in blood sugar tend to trigger a lot of the retinopathy problems. So it's, um, and blood pressure in a diabetic is like gasoline on a fire. You definitely want to have both of those conditions as well controlled as possible. Okay, let's flip to the next one. Okay, so this is the one that probably most of you tuned into for. Um, this is a picture of a patient with dry macular degeneration. And macular degeneration is the leading cause of vision loss in our age group of patients. Um, it, 80 to 90% of, of cases are dry. There is no bleeding, there is no swelling, and it tends to be, we tend to find it mildly, usually after the age of 60. The nice thing about it is it tends to be very slowly progressive. About 10 to 20% of macular degeneration is what we call the wet form. And we'll flip to the next picture. So in this case, you can see, this is a, the optic nerve. You can see over where we looked at it earlier. And just to the left of that, you'll see a large area of blood. And in the middle of all that blood, and you will see a lot, it's, it, if you could look at it with both eyes, it, it's domed up, it's, there's swelling, there's fluid underneath that area. So what happens in macular degeneration? There's an, there's an area of our retina. Our retina is 13 layers deep. And the deepest layer, the one furthest away, is, is kind of a, we call it a basement membrane. But what it does is it protects the retina from abnormal blood vessels growing in there. If we get cut, we have blood vessels that grow in and try to heal an area. When that area of the retina degenerates, there's nothing to stop abnormal little blood vessels from growing into that space. And they're not normal vessels. They have very weak walls and they break easily and they leak easily. And then they cause a lot of scarring. So I'm an old dog now. <laughs> But when I first started, um, there are very few things in that I think back of. There are about three, three things. There have been a lot of progression in ophthalmology, but there are three things that really um, have been what I consider the miracles of my generation. And the treatment of wet macular degeneration is one of them. When I started 32 years ago, and we would have a patient that came in like this, we would do almost like an angiogram where we would put a dye in a vein in their hand and it would fill up the back of the eye, it would fill up all those blood vessels and we could find the blood vessels where it was leaking, which we thought was pretty remarkable. And so what did we do? We lasered them. So when we lasered that area, we destroyed that part of the retina. We destroyed that part of the macula to sacrifice that area to try to keep the vision on the side so it didn't keep bleeding and leaking. And so even if we stopped the bleeding and leaking, that patient was left with this huge blind spot right in the middle of their vision, right where you want to see the word the when you're reading. You know, it's just dead ahead. It was, a, it was a horrible treatment, but it was the only thing we had. And about 15 years ago, there was a development of a drug called an anti-VEGF medication. It's a chemical that stops these abnormal blood vessels from growing. And so in the process of stopping that, it allows all of that fluid, all of that blood to get resorbed and go away. There's no laser, no laser done. And then the vision improves as all of that swelling and the blood goes away. 
and it stops new blood vessels from growing. Now, this is one that most of you either have heard of somebody that has had this done. This, these are the patients that go in for their monthly injections in the, into their eye. It sounds terrible, but it actually, these retina guys are slick. They're in and out before, <laughs> literally before a patient can blink. So it's not a painful procedure and it maintains a vision and it can be done for many years. So in the past, it was really, if you had someone with wet macular degeneration, the chances of them losing their central vision was nearly 100%. With the treatment, the success rate of this treatment is 80%. It is miraculous. Mm -hmm. So it's, it doesn't get rid of the disease, it controls the disease. And how often you need the, the injections is still a very contested uh, research project that's going on. So the last thing that I wanna mention about macular degeneration, because I know that this is gonna be a big question. The first thing that I always preface when I have to tell someone for the first time that they have macular degeneration, the first thing I always say is you are never going to go blind from this problem. This is not a cause of blindness. Glaucoma, you can go blind. Um, diabetic retinopathy, definitely you can go blind. Macular degeneration, you can lose your central vision, but you still have your peripheral vision. And most people, even at its very worst, are able to live independently and take care of themselves. They may need somebody to help them read their bills or pay their bills, but they're usually in, able to lead, lead an independent life. The, the other thing I wanna kind of discuss is, this is a question I get a lot is, what about the vitamins? You know, because that's the big discussion on you know, the treatment for macular degeneration. And Kathleen, I'll have you progress, I think one more. Um, let's go. This is, yeah, go back, go back one. Okay. I just, I'll touch on these. This is an example. Go back one more. If you look at the bottom two pictures in here, you'll see a little dip in the, in the retina. So the retina is going along and it dips down. That's called the fovea. That's called the foveal contour. And it's beautiful. That one looks great. Let's look at the next one. So in this patient, they've got an area where there are abnormal blood vessels deep in the retina. And these are the areas of the retina. And the main thing I want you to see is there's no dip anymore. In fact, it's a hill, it's a mountain. And all of that is fluid and blood from the macular degeneration. Okay, let's go one more. And this is something that I left at the library. If any of you would like, I um, Kathleen will probably have instructions yeah, on there. Um, it's in the health spot. I put them in, there's like magazine racks and brochure racks, and it's right there for anybody to take them. Right. So I set a bunch of these um, Amsler grids out. This is a way for someone who has macular degeneration to check your vision. And these are kind of the Cadillac of the macular degeneration um, grids, because what they require is there's the, where the red dots are is your blind spot for each eye. The key factor on doing this, and it, it's all written out very, very clearly on the instructions, as you can see up above. But the, the main thing that you want to remember is don't do it with both eyes open. That defeats the purpose. This has to be done one eye at a time because you're looking, as you look at the little white dot in the middle of this grid, you're looking for any broken lines, any wavy lines, that shows you an area that may be affected. I always like to do these the first time with patients in the chair in my room, because if you wait till they get home and they see it, they go, oh, you know, I have this problem and they call me the next day. And I say, no, 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 that's why you're doing it because you do have a problem. What we're looking for is any sudden changes because there is that risk that that dry form of macular degeneration will turn into the wet form. 
And if it does, you want to identify that quickly and get back in with your ophthalmologist and have them look. Um, our brains are amazing organs. And it is amazing that with our eyes, if one eye has a problem, our brain just flips the switch over to the other eye. And we may never even know it. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had patients come in and say, I lost my vision last night. And it's, they've had a cataract for five years, but they hadn't closed the other eye and hadn't noticed it. So it's, it's amazing what our brain will do. It will just switch over to the other eye. Okay, flip to the next one. Um, and then this is the, the part I wanna talk about with um, the vitamins. The National Institute of Health and the National Eye Institute started a, a research project about 20 years ago on the use of vitamins with macular degeneration. Using a, a vitamin, and the, the main takeaway on this is the ARIDS-2. So it should be very clearly written on any, there are a lot of different brands. I don't care which brand you use. They're, they all have to meet the same criteria, but they have to say ARIDS-2. Using an ARIDS-2 vitamin has been shown over the course of time to decrease the progression of moderate to severe glauc or macular degeneration by 25%. So it is a, I do encourage that for those of you who do have macular degeneration. If you don't have it, or you have a family history of it, um, there has been over a 10 year study, it showed no difference in the patients who used it and didn't. So I would say, save your money, only use it if you've been given the diagnosis of macular degeneration. Um, and the other thing that I, I, you know, whenever you give a talk, you kind of go back and look up what, what's new, what could be out there that I've missed. I did find out some really interesting three times a week of moderate exercise decreases the risk of switching from dry to wet macular degeneration by 70%. So that, and that is on the Academy of Ophthalmology um, website. Let's go to the next slide. This is. Yep. No, the next one. Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, one more. Okay. Ah, that one. Oh, keep going. Let's. Oh. We, sh we should get one that has. Oh, I think I didn't. I didn't have. Um, was it your notes? Yes, that yeah, was what I, I wanted. Okay, that's yeah. okay. I've got Sorry about that. They, I couldn't pull them up. Okay, so for all of you um, students or people that like to kind of work on the internet, there's a couple websites that I think um, would be that you would really appreciate. One is aao.org. The AAO.org is the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and they are huge into patient education. So everything that I've discussed today, every disease process you can imagine with the eye, you can, it is a fabulous resource to go to AAO.org. And then I'm also going to throw in just a little um, plus for Audio Reader. Audio Reader here in at, at the University of Kansas is a reading network, which is so invaluable to people who have macular degeneration. They read books, they read magazines, they read the newspaper, they do special readings. If you have something you want read to you, they will do that at no charge. Um, and that is another website. You can Google, just Google audio reader Lawrence, Kansas, and that will come up. I have those written down. I also put down a website. Maybe we could throw some of those in with the Amsler grid, um, make a few copies and put them there because I also have a great sausage kale recipe because kale is fabulous for your eyes. <laughs> Absolutely. We can staple it on. Okay. Wow. All right. Okay, great. Well, let's unshare the screen. I do have a lot of questions still um, hanging out there. So we'll try to get through these okay. as well quickly as we can. Um, there are a couple of questions about saline solution and whether that's good enough for dry eye in terms of the 
the solution you put your lenses in or re-wetting drops? No, I would not do that. There's a lot of preservatives in them. They're really not made for dry eyes. And I think they're for a younger uh, age group with a lot more natural tear production. I would stick with just a, it doesn't have to be an expensive artificial tear, but I would do just a good basic artificial tear. Great. Okay. And then what's your opinion? I, you know, you talked about vitamins for um, the condition. What just in general, what's your opinion of uh, lutein and fish oil, vitamin E, just daily supplements? Um, I, the lutein and the zeaxanthine are part of the ARIDS two mm. vitamins. Okay. So when you're taking those, um, that's really what you're using it for. The vitamin E is, there was a lot of talk about using that for dry eyes. That really has been, I just went to a conference about a year ago and the cornea guys really got into a big argument about some of them really thought it was helpful and others did not. So I think the jury's out on vitamin E still. Okay. Are there ways to improve your vision at night when driving? Um, Lenses, get your cataracts or... removed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, you know, I, I have patients that come in. I've had some truck drivers who have come in and they have used those uh, yellow lens, the blue blocking lenses. And I, I did, um, I did do a literature search and I went to a conference where they had a program on that and there's nothing that shows that it helps, but they swear by it. So anecdotally, I would say I've had patients that said it helps because there's really nothing much else to do. Uh, it doesn't hurt and they're inexpensive. So you could try that, but I would say, no, I think if you're having difficulty with night driving, I would be considering um, making sure you you don't have cataracts. Okay, and, and just, you need, can I you... ask for clarification? Sorry. Yeah. So the yellow, those yellow sunglasses, right. so they are or are not anecdotally helpful? Anecdotally, they are helpful. Patients okay. tell me that they help. I've had several truck drivers who swear by them, but okay. when I do a literature search and when I look to see when they do contrast sensitivity testing and visual acuity testing, there's no difference in patients that have them and don't. So I don't know whether that's a placebo effect or not, but I can't, I can't recommend them, but I also don't say that, I mean, I, if they're $10 and they, and they seem to help you, I, they're not going to hurt. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And if you do need cataract surgery, how do you find a good surgeon? Now that you've retired. <laughs> I think you ask a lot of questions. Um, I think you talk to friends and family that have had their cataracts done, um, ask about communication. You definitely want somebody that's American board certified, part of the American Board of Ophthalmology, so ABO. Um, I think that's just a basic, but um, most optometrists uh, that, because, and I, my dad's, my dad's a retired optometrist. I grew up with optometry. I work very intimately with a lot of optometrists over the years. There are a lot of fabulous optometrists. They can diagnose cataracts they see the outcomes of a lot of the local ophthalmologists in their areas. So I tend to trust them. I would ask if they co-manage because if they're getting paid part of the fee, you don't want that to be one of the reasons why they're referring you to that doctor. Um, but I think, that, I think that that is, you can call me, I guess. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Here's another one. If you're diagnosed with scleritis, can you have cataract surgery? Yes, you can. But Good. those patients, oftentimes, um, when I've done the, when I've done those patients in the past, I will pre-treat them with either topical or oral steroids, um, and I will pre-treat them whether even if the scleritis has not been active for a while, I will pre-treat them for a week or so with a fairly hefty dose just to prevent any flare up for, of that condition afterwards. They need to be followed up really carefully afterwards, but there is no reason that they can't have cataract surgery. 
Great. And what are floaters and how do you get rid of them? Please, you don't he said. Rid, you don't get rid of them. Um, Mother nature kind of gets rid of them. Our fantastic brain gets rid of them, honestly. So a floater is a, it's a process that occurs in the vitreous, the jelly in the back of our eye begins to degenerate as we get older. And just so you know, we start to get older and our eye starts to degenerate from the age of four years old on. So it's not like all of this is just happening when we're 60. This has been happening a long time, but we start noticing more of these changes after the age of 60. So a floater is a little piece of collagen that's floating around within that vitreous. And the vitreous is really jelly-like when we're young, almost like jello. But as we get older, the vitreous starts to liquefy. It's more like water. And so those little things can float around more and you see them more. So we notice them more, but the good part of that is because it's more watery, they tend to sink over time. So as they sink, as they go down, the way we see is opposite. So it goes up in our vision, up out of, it's up underneath our eyelid. We don't see them anymore. And the amazing thing about our brain is if one is sticking around kind of in one area, the brain at some point says, ah, I've seen you. I, I'm, I'm used to you. You're not new. I'm just going to ignore you. And the patient totally forgets and doesn't even notice they're there. So they may come and come in to see me one year and say, I've got this huge floater. I look back there, I see it. I go, oh yeah, you've got that. And then they come back three or four years later and I say, hey, that floater hasn't moved. It's still in the very same spot. And I kind of laugh about it. And they say, oh, I, it's been gone for like three or four years. And it's still there. Our brain just turns it off. So they will go away eventually. Um, in very severe cases, a vitrectomy could be done, but that's a huge surgery with big risks. So it's not something that we ever go to first. Okay. And how long does it take for cataracts to develop or does it vary? And it, do you know what causes them besides aging? Ultraviolet light, steroids, diabetes. Those are the big causes for uh, cataracts, especially in somebody younger. Diab most, most 30 and 40 year olds that I have done surgery on have usually been diabetic that, that I do them. Um, and what was the first part of that question? How long does it take for them to oh, develop? The younger you are, the faster they happen. So if you're, if you're 40 or 50, they can happen within a period of a few months. But once you get to about 60s, 70s, it can take them years before they develop to the point where you have to have something done about them. So you're recommending sunglasses, I take it, for people yes. prone to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sunglasses is, are always a good idea. Does eye color have anything to do with it? No. Like if you have a light eye, okay. No. Um, all right, let's see. Oh, thanks for the info about wet macular degeneration. What about dry macular degeneration? I would use the ARIDS too. I would make sure I'm out there hoofing it on the pavement three times a week. Um, getting, ex getting the exercise. I would be eating as many brightly colored vegetables and citrus as I can. That's why I mentioned the kale. Kale, spinach, carrots, um, anything, red peppers, you know, bell peppers, green bell peppers, yellow, orange bell peppers, anything that's brightly colored or deeply colored usually has more of the lutein and zeaxanthine. And so it's a, it's a good vegetable to eat a lot of, but exercise and the vitamins. Okay. Do you have time for two more? I, we're sure. over. So no, I'm fine. Okay. Okay. Um, isn't night vision pro common for older people? I had cataract surgery 15 years ago. So I don't so, know if, whether that means she's still having night vision problems. Uh, there, there is. Um, as we get older, no matter how good our vision is, Part of the aging process is the loss of contrast sensitivity. So things, white has to be on black for us to see it more clearly. A uh, light gray on a little bit darker gray is really difficult to distinguish. 
our vision is good, but our contrast sensitivity starts to decrease. So, and, and that has to do with night vision adaptation also. If you ever go into a movie theater, you'll watch the teenagers just like run in there. It's dark, there's no lights on. They go and they just go sit down. And then the rest of us, 60 plus, we're kind of hugging the wall, you know, <laughs> looking around saying, where is an open seat? <laughs> Oh, and not to mention the middle of the night, you know, yeah, and it, just... it does when you turn the lights on and then to go to the bathroom and then you turn them off it that it is dark adaptation. It's normal. It just takes us longer to dark adapt to dark to adapt to the dark than it does when we're younger. OK, I, I'm going to ask that you don't send me any more questions because I keep uh, because we want to let the doctor go uh, to dinner, but I'm going to get to them. So is there a good way to tell the difference between a visual migraine and something that needs medical attention? This is, that's, a, that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. I am a migraine patient. I started having migraines when I was four or five years old. And I would get, uh, I would get a drooping of my face and I would lose my vision, a lot of severe nausea and vomiting. I was really sick for a number of years. Fortunately, as we age, a lot of that goes away. And when you get into your 60s and 70s and you get a migraine, it's oftentimes what we call an ophthalmic migraine. So you'll get this scintillating scotoma, which is like a picket fence that's all these beautiful colors, but it kind of takes out your vision. It may start in the middle and move out to the side. It may start from the side and move into the middle. But that, that vision loss when, is very typical for a classic migraine. As we get older, we don't get the headache. We just get this visual symptom. It's in both eyes. And the biggest thing I tell patients is, remember when it happens, do this, do this. Because if it's in both eyes, you know you're not having a retinal detachment. You're not gonna have a retinal detachment in both eyes at the same time. So now here's the next thing. If it's not a retinal detachment, is it an ophthalmic migraine or is it a stroke? And I can't give you a 100%, there's in medicine, there is no thing, such thing as 100%. But if a visual scintillating scotoma is present, has not moved in over an hour, I would go to the emergency room. Okay. So under an hour, most ophthalmic migraines are 10 or 15 minutes and they resolve on their own. But if they're lasting more than an hour, then I think it's something, I think it's something that should be worked up. Okay. I'm going to combine the last two questions because they're related. And I, by the way, you're getting rave reviews in the comments. <laughs> um, this really was excellent. We are learning a lot. Um, okay. So here are the two questions I'm combining. Uh, does past LASIK surgery cause problems for later cataracts? And do you recommend vision correction surgery during cataract surgery? Okay, those are those, we could talk about that for like days. <laughs> <laughs> Both of those questions. So putting them together was like the double whammy, Kathy. Sorry, well, just, <laughs> I'm just trying to respect everybody's time. Okay, my apologies. So, so um, yes, I do believe, you know what? I'm not a huge uh, proponent of cosmetic surgeries. Um, so it's really hard for me to, to be an absolute on this. And there are a lot of extenuating cir circumstances, but when cataract surgery is done, we have a unique opportunity to fix two problems at the same time. And if somebody has a large amount of astigmatism that they've always had to wear their glasses for, this is the one chance that that can get fixed. Medicare, no insurance company will pay for that because it's considered cosmetic. But it's now at a very affordable rate. There are a lot of cornea specialists have become what I call refractive cataract surgeons. And they do a lovely job at, for maybe $1,000 out of pocket, 
they will get rid of that astigmatism with a special implant at the time that they're doing the cataract surgery. And I like that. Um, as far as the lenses that see both distance and near, that I would say, if it's something you're interested in, you should see a refractive cataract surgeon and ask them a lot of these questions. Ha I always tell my patients, please write your questions down at home and then bring them to me because they get in the chair and they get nervous and, and they feel like there's time constraint. And I'm always going to take as much time as they need. But if they can't remember their questions, I can't answer them. So write down those questions before you go in, especially if you're considering a, what I would say, a non-traditional implant. The second, the first question that you asked me, that was the second part of that question. The first part you asked me is, does LASIK procedure affect things down the road with cataract surgery? Absolutely. Our ability to be able to, um, to predict what exact power of implant that we need to put in when we do cataract surgery is affected by previous surgeries because it affects the thickness of the cornea. It affects the curvature of the cornea, which in turn affects the measurements that we use to calculate the power of the implant. So we can, we're pretty darn spot on these days with getting an implant, the right power um, that what we think they're gonna need is what they're gonna need post-operatively. But if somebody has LASIK, it's called a post-operative surprise and it's not a good post-operative surprise. So it is something to think about if, when you're weighing pros and cons of LASIK procedures, that's a cosmetic procedure. And it's something that can, if you are in your fifties or sixties, I would say, by the time you're 60 years old, there's a 50% chance you're gonna have a cataract already. Don't do LASIK when you're in your 50s or 60s. The time to do LASIK is when you're in your 20s and 30s, when you have a lifetime to enjoy it and not have to wear your glasses. By the time you get to be our age, I, I think that you're not gonna do LASIK, you would do a refractive cataract surgery instead. Okay, you did that. You did the Reader's Digest version of Two or three hours, very good. Well, that is all the time we have. I, I'd ask everybody to unmute um, yourself so we can, so she can hear our applause because yes. it really was excellent and you're getting lots of um, great comments. Oh, nice job. Thank you. Thank and you. To put this together for us a month after your retirement, um, not, to, not to say you were rusty at all, but I mean, it's just the time. It was uh, very much appreciated. You know, my career has been the joy of my life. It has been um, awesome. And I missed, I will miss sharing that. Um, so it's been, a, it's been my honor and pleasure to, right. to visit. Well, I, for one, took copious notes. And, uh, <laughs> That's great. You what know my phone number, Kathy. Yeah. <laughs> we got to speed dial. <laughs> Will this be will this be video on, uh, recorded? Yes. Yes. So yeah. again, that uh, we have a playlist on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and Kathleen, why don't you say this? Because I yeah, actually, you know, I've got everybody's emails. As soon as it's posted, do would you like me? I can just send the link out so you have it. That'd be a lot would easier. Would you guys like that? I yeah. mean, yes. you, you can yes. delete it if you it's don't. It's sometimes hard to find because they yeah. they are in chronological order, and I don't know. Is there oh, a way, Kathleen, funny. that you can include those um, those websites that I wrote yes. down? Yeah, that would be. I think that would be really nice. I would really like you all to have the AAO website. Okay. I think it's yeah. a fabulous learning tool, and when you you come home from a visit and you're not exactly sure, it's a really good place to turn to. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you again, All right. Cindy, Dr. Pensler. Thank My you so pleasure. much. My pleasure. Thank you for everybody who's coming. We have um, skin on February 8th at 4 p.m. At least that's what it says on the website. I just